Julianne Good, and this is Psych One on One. We are here to make psychology more understandable with tips for you, your family, and your friends to make your lives easier. This afternoon, we are having a special guest from Baltimore, Dr. Brita McGrath, and we're going to be talking about international psychology. So we're going to be expanding our boundaries a bit here. Hi, Dr. McGrath. How are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. Leanne, how are you? I'm doing wonderful, and it's so good to finally hear you. We've been uh, emailing <laughs> back and forth, and uh, you live in Puerto Rico, correct? I do. I'm in Baltimore for a, a wonderful training for the, the next couple of days, but I typically am in Puerto Rico. Wonderful. So you're a little bit closer within our boundaries. <laughs> we thought we were going to be <laughs> Skyping today, and we had a little bit of uh uh, problems with the Skype, but uh, so luckily you're within the United States. And how is it going over in Baltimore? It's going fine. It's going fine. It would have been uh, a U.S. call, mind you, from Puerto Rico as well, but things are going well here in Baltimore. The weather is a little different, um, but I'm at a wonderful workshop on the intercultural developmental inventory, which is really fantastic and it's in keeping with um, the whole idea of international psychology. So it's it's great to stay on the same track. Wonderful. You'll have to give us a little information about that as we go on within the conversation. Sure. So can you tell the listening audience a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, I'm from Ireland originally, um, and I came to the U.S. in 1995 to study psychology. Um, I did my master's and, and uh, doctoral degrees at Loyola in Chicago. And I started my career in psychology in the area of school psychology. And then I moved into administration, I guess, and then uh, moved into international psychology. So right now I'm the department chair of the international psychology program at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. And we have a, a master's program and a doctoral program in our department. And uh, we're pretty excited to tell you about it. That's wonderful. So how did you get into doing international psychology? That's a great question. Well, coming from another country, that's, of course, a good place to start. Yes. Um, but growing up, I always had relatives who were abroad for a variety of different reasons, um, mainly humanitarian aid, um, missionary work, that kind of thing. Um, travel was always interesting to me. From the psychological perspective, I think that's where I really got into this kind of work. I'm fascinated just by the way in which we look at people's behaviors, their norms, their values, the things they do, um, their mental health. And when the opportunity arose to get into um, psychology from this multiple plural perspective, I was really excited about it because I wanted to integrate my own culture and the various different cultures that I have worked with and learned about throughout my, my career and my life International psychology was sort of a, a way to bring together both my personal and my professional, um, I guess, goals, ambitions, desires. You know, I could, I could get paid to do things that I really love to do, to explore why people do the things they do, um, how we can be healthier, um, how we can work together better, how we can make this world a better place. And international psychology, for me, really provided that kind of respect of, why people in different countries do things slightly differently. Um, it wasn't just, you know, this is the best way to do things or this is what everyone should be doing. That just didn't reflect reality for me or enough respect for the broad diversity that exists in the world. And so having the opportunity to be able to explore with faculty and students, you know, with this field, the diversity, the richness that exists out in the world, that to me is, is really exciting. And so... That's how I get into this area. That's wonderful. And I agree. I mean, there's there's so many ways to learn about other cultures now. It's almost like combining anthropology with psychology. Absolutely. That's a really good way to put it, Julianne, because anthropology has really developed as a field of uh, respect and appreciation for difference. And, you know, when you when you look at international psychology, we're searching not just for how everyone is the same, but we're also looking for patterns of difference. And I think there's a, an appreciation for the fact that in certain areas we agree on certain things, and in other areas we do things very differently, and that that's valid. And uh, 
you know, being able to live with the tension between the differences and the similarities. It's really key, knowing what's right for you, knowing what some of the universal standards are, you know, what's good for everyone. There are certain things that are good for everyone. Exactly. Uh, and there are certain things that are, you know, certain patterns or certain traditions that really suit certain people, but not others. Right. And then we can learn from each other about our differences yeah. and hopefully strengthen each other's cultures by saying, wow, well, I, I never knew that about your culture. And mm-hmm. I think that's a, you know, I think that's great. Maybe I'll start incorporating some of that in, into my own culture or my own behavior okay. and change. And that's actually one of the key uh, things we talk to our students about. So we have about, we have over 160 doctoral students um, in our online program. And when we, when we talk to our students about what they're going to study for their dissertations, um, that's one of the key pieces that we focus on. You know, you don't just go to another country and study what they're doing and say, you know, what's wrong with what they're doing or what challenges do they have there. We also look at what we can learn from them. For example, we, we go to Peru and... Uh, our faculty member that brings our group to Peru, Dr. Carol Craddock, really has some great information and great uh, stories to tell about how in Peru we could really learn from the way in which they do early intervention and the way they do community psychology. There's a lot we could learn about the way they deliver mental health services and the way they involve the community, involve the family in early intervention. Um, And that's an important piece for us to remember. You know, a lot of the psychological research that's out there in the world has been generated in the U.S. I mean, there's a great commitment to research and development in the United States. But unfortunately, most of the research has been done on people within the United States. And in fact, even on graduate students within the United States. And when you think about that, graduate students in universities in the United States don't necessarily have a great deal in common with the entirety of the rest of the world. They exactly, might they're not the norm. <laughs> right, they might represent, uh, Jeffrey Arnott has this great article from 2008 that says, you know, most of the research represents about 5% of the world mm-hmm. population. So if we're basing our observations and our generalizations, the things that we say about people, here's how people are, if we're saying that that's based on what we've you know, observed from 5% of the population. We really have a lot of work to do. There's a whole 95% out there that's not like undergraduate students in American universities. Yes. And I think that's the, the press and the, the real mission of international psychology is to really spread that investigation. Let's go out there and look at what's going on in the rest of the world. What are the patterns in the rest of the world? What are the values? What are the cultures? Let's gather some data. Let's see how they do things. Let's see what's the reality there and what can we learn from that and how can we better describe humanity so that psychology is a a field for everybody and not just, you know, a narrow field that describes a certain section of the population. Let's say what anxiety is or let's say what resiliency is let's say what mental health is from a much richer perspective let's include everyone in the conversation let's exactly let's let's paint a much wider paint, uh, yeah. picture with our with our psychological paintbrush and exactly. and see what support systems are set up within each culture so that if they are having problems in their society yeah. How can we go in and, and um, make a, a cooperation between cultures mm-hmm. and strengthen up that support system? Because there's so many cultures that don't have a psychology service per se. They don't have the outpatient right. clinics. They don't have it in the hospitals. They have maybe some doctors or shamans mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. ministers mm-hmm. or priests. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And they also have, you know, interesting leadership structures so that a leader in a community can really have a powerful impact on a family's desire to increase the health of the group or to really take on a positive intervention um, in a way that we might not have, say, in a Western culture. So that focus on um, understanding what the forces are, what the strengths are within the community that we can use in order to reach those goals that we're, that we're trying to reach. 
And there's another piece of it too. Um, the reality across the world is that everything is becoming more connected and more global. And, you know, when you think about, let's say, when you and I were applying for jobs, we were competing with people in our own hometown and probably people across the country, which was different to what our parents' generation was competing against. Yes. And you look at the next generation, and every time someone uh, competes for a job, they are competing with the rest of the world because of the movement of globalization, you know, in technology, economy, industry, psychology also has to move into that globalization movement. And, you know, what we want to be able to do is train psychologists who are really cutting edge, who are able to tackle the problems of a globalized society, you know, where they have the skills and the perspective. They're thinking both locally and nationally and then also globally because you want to be able to you know, bring your skills to wherever it is you want to work or wherever the work is. And that's another piece of this picture. We want to train people for the market that's out there. Um, and we're understanding that, you know, we're getting a better picture on the cultures in different countries and how that reality is relevant for everyone because there's greater movement and the need is there. Right. And we impact each other. You know, each country impacts one another, whether we like it or not. You think about Ebola. And the impact that had on so many different countries, you think about how interdependent we are. Psychologists need to be able to tackle those issues, not just from the local perspective, but also globally. And that's something we really want to be able to train people for. Right. And the big push now for many universities is to train therapists who are well-versed in diversity. They can go in and sit down with virtually anybody and start doing therapeutic work, at least start building a rapport and let the client feel like they're being supported and heard. Mm -hmm. That's right. And you know, there's a lot of work you have to do in order to be able to understand someone else's culture. You really need to understand your own first and then understand the goals, how psychology is received, you know, what's really needed there, what's the short-term gain, what's the long-term, you know, impact, and how do you really want to leave a footprint that's not going to cause damage? Right. And that's, that's a really great point. We're training students um, for a couple of different kinds of concentrations. Um, and we focus really on humanitarian work in the international psychology programs. We're in the doctor program. We have two uh, two particular concentrations. One is the trauma services track, and the other one is uh, the organizations and systems track. And so they're really quite different. Um, most of the students who are coming into the trauma services track already have some clinical training. So they might have been a social worker, a counselor, uh, some kind of crisis prevention specialist. Um, so they already have a background in. Uh, intervention, disaster and crisis intervention of some type. Um, and so what they're doing is really stepping up their skills so that they can work internationally and not just within the multicultural perspective of the U.S., but to go beyond that. Um, some people do want to work abroad. Others want to work in the U.S. with groups who are moving into the U.S. who have come here for work or various reasons. Um, in the master's program, we have similar concentrations. We have a management and leadership concentration. We have a trauma and group conflict concentration. And we also then have an environmental advocacy concentration because what we're finding is that these are three of the main areas that are of real concern in the world today. I mean, there are real pressing issues for globalization, and those are, you know, the threats to the natural environment that's in the news all the time. Uh, Intergroup conflict, you know, we're seeing that in the news every day, whether it's one country or another, one group or another, we're hearing about that. And, and most people are trying to figure out where does this, you know, fit in my life? How is this relevant for me? What do I need to be doing about this? And what do my values tell me I need to do about it in order to, you know, make the world a better place? Yes. And then the other area, which is risks to physical and mental health. That's the more traditional um psychology perspective and so we're we're really looking at those three areas and providing students with some some training and all of those and it, it kind of broadens the 
the traditional definition of psychology as well. Yes, it sounds like it's a very extensive program for both the doctorate and the master's. And after commercial break, can we get into that and tell us a little bit more about uh, what the challenges are of having so many um, programs under the international psychology umbrella? Sure, absolutely. The Chicago School of Professional Psychology offers numerous psychology, behavioral, and health-related science graduate degrees at three campuses, Los Angeles, California, including branches in Westwood and Irvine, Chicago, Illinois, and Washington, D.C., and online. The Chicago School prepares students to meet the ever-changing mental health needs of society through classroom experience and real-world training. The Chicago School Counseling Centers in Irvine and Westwood provide caring, confidential, and affordable psychological services to individuals and their families. For more information, visit thechicagoschool.edu. And thank you to the Chicago School of Professional Psychology for sponsoring Psych One on One. This is Julianne Good with Dr. Brita McGrath calling in from Baltimore. We're talking about international psychology. And before the commercial break, we were talking about what is under the umbrella of the master's and doctorate programs for the international psychology program of the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. So can you explain what the challenges are about uh, having so many variations of these programs? Yes, it sounds like a lot, doesn't it? You know, yes. trying to figure out whether you're going to go into organizational management, international organizational management, or whether you're going to do trauma and conflict, or whether you're going to look at environmental issues. Um, it's not as complicated as it sounds, because what we've done is we've set up the master's and the doctoral programs so that they're connected. Um, you can go straight from the master's into the doctoral program. For example, you could start in trauma and group conflict, and then you could move into the trauma services track in the doctoral program. Um, you could start in the management and leadership track in the master's level and then move into the organizations and systems track at the doctoral level. At the moment, we have the environmental advocacy track in the master's program. We haven't yet developed the environmental advocacy or environmental psychology track in the doctoral program because we're, we're not seeing... Um, the great level of interest at the doctoral level. But as soon as we see people knocking at the door for that, we will be able to, to develop it and roll it out. So when a student comes in, they sort of have to decide, first of all, if they're going to do a master's or a doctoral degree. And then, it, you know, the admissions counselors and the faculty help the student look at their background and figure out what's the best fit for them both for their personal and their professional goals. Are you interested in going into international and multicultural organizations, you know, working with humanitarian aid or NGOs or Red Cross or Peace Corps or something like that, or even maybe in a human resources kind of capacity with international organizations? Or are you more interested in working with, um, with say, crisis prevention, trauma, that sort of area? And when we talk to students, we say, well, you know, considering the doctoral program, you're going to do some unique research. You're going to do a piece of dissertation research. What really lights your fire? What's your passion? Is it more in the organizations and systems area? Or is it more in, you know, the effects of trauma, the effects of conflict on specific groups? Um, and so that really kind of helps someone sort out what they're going to do. And then in both programs, we have um, what we call a field experience. Students travel with a faculty member in a small group of usually under 15 to another country. And the countries that we typically travel to are Peru, Brazil, uh, Rwanda, South Africa, China, Germany. We've traveled to the Philippines. We have traveled to Ghana. And so what we do is we send students on a pretty rigorous um, field experience where you really get to engage with community partners there and see sort of what your work would be like internationally. You get a perspective on, you know, what, how your skills fit with what's needed out there. And we have integrated the master's program 
field experience with the doctoral program so that the students get a sense of, you know, what each program is like and they get the opportunity to work together. Um, and I think that's kind of important. I have to tell you, Julianne, the students in the International Psychology Program are the most fascinating group of people I have ever met. People who are interested and really committed to doing international humanitarian aid work or international organizational work are amazing people. They have the most amazing life stories and backgrounds. There's always a personal reason behind why they want to do this. And it's it's just always made me think about these students with awe and be so grateful for the chance to get to work with them. Can you tell us about one of your students that especially stands out? You don't need to name names or anything, but just kind of yeah, their backgrounds. No, it's, it's tough to think of just one, but there, there are a few that really, um, in my short time in the program, I have gotten to know. And um, one, for example, has, um, she's from Iran originally, and she was a refugee in multiple countries. At one point, she was in Turkey uh, before she came to the United States. And so was an immigrant at multiple different points very early in her life. And she navigated through that immigration experience and is now teaching in a community college in the U.S. and is in the International Psychology Program and um, is studying the immigration experience and what helps individuals um, feel strong and cope well with the immigration experience despite the challenges of it. And so just her own personal story and her passion for the field and the work that she's doing, both as a clinician, she works with immigrant families, and as a, as a community college professor, it's just amazing. And her enthusiasm for life and her experiences within the program are fascinating. Like she told me this amazing story about how one of her field experiences was to Northern Ireland. And her perspective on Northern Ireland as a young woman from Iran was just fascinating to me. I was blown away by the fact that she, you know, and her family were discussing what was going on in Northern Ireland, you know, and what their perspective was compared to my perspective, for example, as someone from Ireland. It was really just amazing. And it really shows me, when I think of her, how uh, connected the world is and how we impact one another, whether it's during times of conflict or otherwise. And I have other students who are studying, for example, indigenous groups, even their own indigenous groups. For example, a student who is from Honduras uh, is studying his own, has studied his own indigenous group there from Honduras. We have students who are studying migrant farm workers. Um, we have students who are studying, um, you know, gentle mutilation in Sierra Leone. We have students who are studying the experiences of women who have been um, abused during armed conflicts in different countries, like in the Congo. I mean, it's really amazing. And the courage these students have to travel. I, I was having a, a challenging conversation with one student, a student who was telling me she really needed to go to Palestine. I mean, that was the only way to get her research done. And I was saying, you know, we really are concerned for your safety. You mm -hmm. know, it's really important that we balance the need for this very important research with um, your safety and just the passion behind um, getting the voices of these people out and helping the world understand what the lived experience is, what the strengths are, and what the challenges are um, for these people. The, the courage of my students is just amazing. Yeah, that that is awe-inspiring, isn't it? Yeah, and it, you know... It really tells you that you don't know a person's story until you sit and listen to them. And um, when I look at, especially with online students, you know, the reason someone becomes an online student is always an interesting story um, because they're always managing multiple different responsibilities. And this is one more thing that they really have had a burning passion to complete in their lives or it's the best way to accomplish this particular goal. And hearing you know, what brings them to this place, why they think that this work needs to be done, why they think, you know, that um, we really need to examine, you know, whatever culture it is. We really need to examine, for example, uh, forgiveness and how forgiveness is working in Rwanda. And this is the 21st anniversary 
this month, in fact, uh, the seventh yesterday was the day they, they celebrated it. And, you know, celebrating such a, a, a dreadful genocide is really just a, a horrifying idea, but the celebration is about the lives of those who've been lost and the the repair work that has been done. And we have so much to learn from uh, what what work they're doing on forgiveness and gratitude um, in the wake of such a horrific um, experience in their history. And, exactly. and just seeing how the students are able to step into that space, you know, to, to lean in, I suppose to use that term, to lean into what the reality is in those countries and really understand what needs to be shared and what we can learn from it. It's just amazing to me. It is, and as you said, Dr. McGrath, um, a lot of these students go and do the the field research with Mm -hmm. safety concerns, and not only that, but a lot of times they have to fund their own travel expenses to -hmm. go to these places. So that's that extra level of commitment. Mm -hmm. But there are so few research studies on many populations because right. of the funding, the the interest is not there by, by the larger gr- research groups or the powers that be that, oh, well, we, we might fund this research study and we may not. It depends on, yeah. it, so there's, there, there is a lot of research that is not getting through when mm-hmm. th- it needs to be done. It's, it's just starting. I'm um, doing a multicultural research class right now or just a, a component mm-hmm. of it within my cognitive assessment class for my doctoral program. And yeah. it's just amazing how much there is not out there and that still needs to yeah. be done and needs to be taken from a um a perspective of of working together to get this information out there to the general public and to the mm-hmm. governments to let them know what is really happening with their population right. what's the right. reality and, and it's hard and and i think you know looking at what students go through to try and make sure this happens one of the one of the ways in which we work with students to really try and help them accomplish their research goals is that we have faculty all over the world. So, for example, if you wanted to do some research in Rwanda, um, we have two faculty members, one adjunct and one affiliate faculty member who live in Rwanda or from Rwanda. And it's possible that, for example, a student might end up doing their field experience in Rwanda, and we keep those costs as low as possible. And so that would mean then that they'd be able to complete their research possibly um, during one of those field experience trips. And then they would be able to possibly work with some of our faculty and some of our our, um, experts from Rwanda and other faculty throughout the school who have the experience in Rwanda. And so, you know, being able to connect people up with the different possibilities and resources that are available is important to us. Um, We have faculty in Brazil. Um, We have partners in Peru. Um, We have a faculty member who is in Australia. Um, We have a faculty member from South Africa who travels regularly to, to South Africa faculty member in China, you know, the list goes on. We have mm-hmm. an adjunct faculty member in Japan. Um, I'm in Puerto Rico. Um, we have someone whose family is from the Philippines. I mean, it's, it's a really good kind of picture on where we, where we are right now. And it gives an idea of how much we want to continue this work and, and engage our students in this work in broadening the field of psychology. Um, uh, the, we're going to be talking to some people from Indonesia tomorrow about the possibilities of collaborative work there. Um, and there are a number of other study abroad courses at the school um, where we have faculty that are really connected with psychologists in different countries. And that's another way that some of our students are able to launch their research projects and get some support. Um, 
So it's a really exciting way of broadening the field. And it's an exciting new opportunity for students. I mean, a PhD in international psychology is a new idea. Yes. You know, I think we're the, the first school to, to have a PhD in psychology. I know there are a number of um, master's programs in international psychology, but I think we're the first IT degree in, in um, this field, I think. That's beautiful. Now, is all of it online? No, we have um, an online program, and that would be, as I said, about it's over 160 students. Those students come to Chicago to meet with us at least twice in the program. We have very intensive workshops for four days, um, once usually around the end of the first year, you know, and then once uh, at the end of the second year. And then those schedules can change, but it's they know well in advance. They come to Chicago. For workshops and then uh, the second we call them residencies and then the second one is usually for comprehensive exams so they really students get a chance to meet the faculty to meet with their cohort to meet the people they've been in classes with and we usually open those residencies up to anyone else who would like to come and really get connected with the faculty and then the other time that uh, we meet face to face is during that field experience course so when you're in your, you know, at the end of your first year, usually, um, you go in your first field experience course, and you usually go with your cohort, the students that entered the program at the same time you did, and you spend about nine days together with the faculty member. And it's a pretty intense time, and you really get to know each other and rely on each other, and you, you travel twice then during the program, and it's typically with the same group. And so that's that's very, the students have all said that that's a really important time of connection and bonding and developing those relationships. And the personal experience and personal growth that you go through beats any three-hour class, you know, where you're sitting listening to a lecture. Right. Um, I found that our students are really connected through their discussion boards as well. They find that they can really get to know each other because they know the limits of online. They really put everything into it and are open and free with one another and really will say everything in the moment because time flies so quickly and they, they really work very rigorously, do all of their reading and ask the questions that they need to ask. So it's, uh, it's a very intense, engaged program. That's wonderful. And the, the situation is, too, with the students, they're probably able to Skype and email and keep connected yeah. and... Who knows what happens after they graduate? There might be some some bridging for some research between the students, and then Absolutely. internationally. So it just expands that circle so much more. It does, and we actually have some of our graduates teaching in the program, whether it's part time or full time. We have one full time faculty member, and then we have a number of part time faculty um, who have graduated from the program. We also have an on-ground blended version of the program in Washington, D.C. And Dr. Priscilla Das Brailsford is our department chair there. And she has a group of about 40 students in D.C. And they take courses um, in a sort of a blended format. Um, some portion of it is online and then the rest of it is uh, on ground. And so they meet, you know, in more traditional face-to-face -face classes. We still work with the same curriculum. We work, work very closely together and we work off the same curriculum. And then their students take some of our courses online, you know, depending on their schedule. They also join us for field experience. So it's really a very kind of tight community. Um, and we, you know, work on and improve the program all the time together. So we're always on the phone consulting. Um, and we also provide students, as a school, we provide students with the opportunity to use a go to meeting. I don't know if you're familiar with that application. Yes, it's wonderful. Basically, yes. students can, yeah, they can set up a, a meeting, use phone and or video conference. It's through the web, and it really gives students an opportunity to, you know, ex extend beyond just a phone call. Um, and we'd really encourage students to do that. So it sounds like this is a great program at Chicago School of Professional Psychology for the International Psychology Program if you love psychology and love to travel and, mm -hmm. and want to ex expand your world out extensively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing when people start to talk about their personal goals, you know, and how they 
have had some connection or some vision about traveling to a particular country or there's a specific culture that really impacts them or perhaps even maybe part of their own heritage. You know, they really, they love the field of psychology and they want to do something to explore, you know, an indigenous culture or to really broaden traditional psychology and broaden this Western perspective on psychology and really kind of make a difference um, and study that, that group, this is definitely a good option. Um, we often talk to interested, you know, individuals who think it might be a good fit for them. Um, any of the faculty are always willing to have a chat and see, you know, because it's a big commitment. We can definitely have a chat and see if this is a good fit and just process through what the ideas are. Sometimes it's kind of hard to uh, commit to something like this without really talking to somebody about it and figuring out if this could be a good fit. And it's not usually a conversation that you have with many people because it's such a new field. You Mm -hmm. know, people don't often have the chance to say, you know what I'd love to do? I'd really love to go and work for the Red Cross, or I'd really love to go, you know, and work for an international organization, or build my own business, you know, maybe a business that helps groups in various different countries, you know, with real crisis prevention skills or with real multicultural organizational systems awareness. You know, I really want to do it from an international perspective, not just a Western diverse perspective. And it, they don't often have a chance to explore that idea and just process it, process it with many people. And so this is a you know, a chance uh, where we can do that with them and help them think about if this might be a good fit. Yes, so Dr. McGrath, we'll, we'll go, uh, we will discuss that towards the end of the program about how, if a listener is interested in this program, how they can pursue it, what is sure. the process about doing the interview. I think that's really important, as you had mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. And we'll we'll go through some of the steps if anybody's interested in this program because it sounds fascinating. Thanks. That would be fine. Okay. And we're going to take a short commercial break, and we will be back with Dr. Brita McGrath on Psych One on One. Are you searching for answers and insight to life issues? Is the behavior of family or friends questionable or concerning? Find tips and possible solutions from the convenience of your own PC, cell phone, or tablet at therapycable.com. Therapy Cable has the most comprehensive library of contemporary therapy videos online. Help may be as easy as a few clicks away. Therapy Cable offers comprehensive therapy videos ranging from addiction to self-care and contact information for qualified providers. Find the answers to your life challenges at therapycable.com.
And welcome back to Psych One on One with Julianne Good and Dr. Brita McGrath calling in from Baltimore. Dr. McGrath, can you tell us a little bit about the conference that you're at for international psychology? Yes, it's actually a training, Julianne. I'm at a training for the Intercultural Development Inventory. And this is a unique instrument that has been designed to help an individual determine where they're at in their own intercultural competence. So breaking that down, it basically means what's your experience of your own culture and of multiple other cultures? Where are you at with uh, how comfortable you are in working with people and dealing with people from other cultures? And it's really interesting um, developmental sort of a scale. Well, I wouldn't say it's a scale. It's It's an instrument that kind of gives you insights into where you are and where you can be and ways that you can develop your skills so that you can bridge with other cultures more effectively, whether it's in your personal life or in your professional life. And they use it in a variety of different areas. It's used by large organizations. It's used by police departments. It's used by universities, HR departments. It's a really fascinating um, opportunity. So uh, one of my colleagues and I are learning about this instrument and looking at whether we can use it to measure and help people work on their own process of uh, developing their their competency and their skills in working with various groups. It's so extensive. It's almost (laughs) mind-boggling. We're always a work in progress. I think, Julianne, that's one of the things uh, people will always ask is, are you still in school? Are you working in school or are you actually studying again? And it's just, you know, when you find the area that you like, um, it's hard not to keep reading and learning. One of my students has said, you know, she found her home once she found international psychology. So she, you know, this is where everything fits. Everything makes sense now within this field of international psychology because it explains things in a much richer way than what you've been getting in any other area. And so, yeah, when you find your your kind of your professional home, you just keep on getting more and more, and it makes sense. It doesn't feel like going to school all the time. It feels like you're really just engaging in your passion. Yes, and you have to be an explorer and an adventurer to be exactly. <laughs> exactly. to really get into the chest of of learning about so many different cultures. And as you stated before, how are we are different and how are we the same? How can yeah. we connect? How can we find how we are alike to begin with to yeah. start the dialogue happening? Yeah, and being able to be more comfortable with our differences, that they don't mean the things that we think they mean. They don't mean that one person is better than another. They mean we're different. We look at things differently. You know, you think about individualistic societies and collectivistic societies. We do things differently. We interpret situations differently. We think certain things, you know, are more important than others, like time and being on time and doing things by a certain timeline. In certain cultures, they're really important. In other cultures, making sure that your relationships are secure, that you really help people feel respected. Mm -hmm. That's more important than whether or not you're on time. Those are two different ways of looking at things. One is not better than the other. It depends on the situation that you're in. And so just learning that and understanding what the priorities are at play in any situation can be really key. And asking the proper questions. Exactly, exactly. And being alert to sensitivities with the person Mm -hmm. that you're sitting with, being open to a lot of nonverbal communication. Exactly. Spotting those nonverbals, you know, knowing enough about yourself, about, you know, feeling the tension in the room, knowing when it's your stuff, you know, that you're tense about, or knowing if the other person is uncomfortable. Right. And having kind of the the skill level to be able to explore rather than avoid is it's really important. And also, as you had said before, the timing, I think, of communication is so important because there are yeah. cultures that are, they speak very fast. Well, seemingly, mm-hmm. you know, because, of course, it's, it's in a language other than our own native languages, whatever that may mm-hmm. be. And, yeah. and 
once we, you know, speak the same language, what speed is the other person speaking at? It's, yeah. uh, it, it's, there's so, so many factors to take into consideration for being a human and, and for being a therapist, yeah. especially because mm-hmm. the, the world is demanding more of us now for mm-hmm. being interculturally competent. Right. That's exactly it. And so what we find is that the more we learn, the more it helps us move further together, collaborate more. It opens more doors, and that's the main reason to, to keep working on it. It just always open, opens more doors for ourselves and for others. And that's the key, you know, if we're uh, really working to benefit ourselves, we should also be working to benefit others at the same time. And yes. that's, you know, the rising tide raises all boats, right? Yes. Yes, it's very important. Do you have any tips for our listeners for being more comfortable with somebody from another culture and opening up that yeah. communication? That's a great question, Julianne. I think it's probably a very simple tip, and that is to ask someone what's it like. And that you know holds true for every culture. What's it like to be you? So what's it like to live in Baltimore, to live in the Philippines? Rather than uh, presuming it's like something, rather than saying, you know, is it as busy as everyone says it is? Just asking with a smile, what's it like? And hearing whatever it is they tell you and trying to imagine what that's like. The more, the more questions you ask and the more body language you observe, the more information you get. Not mm-hmm. everything is communicated, you know, as you said, some of it's nonverbal. Not everything is communicated verbally. People will say a lot if you look like you're receptive to hear more and that you're not expecting to hear one specific thing. If you bring up stereotypes, you're not as likely to get as much information. Asking more about, oh, and what's that like? And what's that like? And what's it like on the weekend? And, you know, what are different things that are important to you. What are they like in that country? Things that you enjoy. What are the foods like? What are the customs and the rituals? Um, What do people enjoy? Um, What makes people happy? How, you know, how do children play? Those kinds of positive questions will always give you positive revelations about another culture. Um, But in general, the very simple question of what's it like to be you? That's what we're asking, ultimately. Tell me from your perspective how you feel, not are you feeling, you know, anxious? Are you feeling happy? Are you feeling sad? That's a yes or no kind of a closed question. But asking a person, share with me what your experience is like. I'm open to hearing because I really don't know. And that's if people see that kind of openness from you, that you want to learn and that you're conscious that you don't know, then they they will share with you. Yes, and, and many times they are open to sharing. It's like, oh, you're interested in me. You're interested in my culture. You're interested in learning. I am so willing to share with you. And that's a beautiful connecting point. Yeah, because it communicates respect for whatever you, you have to share. It does. And Dr. McGrath, as we're wrapping up, can you tell the listening audience about uh, how they can get involved in the International Psychology Program at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology? Absolutely. There's a lot of information about the International Psychology Department online. Um, You can apply online. It'll tell you what the prerequisites are for the master's program and for the Ph.D. program. Um, It'll explain all the information about the different tracks that I mentioned. Um, And there are connections there to talk to an admissions counselor. But also, if anyone would like to discuss um, the program or just ask a couple of questions and hear more about it, I'm always available by phone, by email. I can be emailed at bmcgrath at the chicagoschool.edu. And I'd be happy to connect anyone with any of our faculty, even the faculty in different countries, if that's something specific that would help a person decide if this is a good fit for them. That's wonderful. And that email is bmcgrath at the Chicago School dot edu. That's it. Wonderful. 
And is there anything else that you would like to state about um, the international psychology importance? Yeah, I, Julianne, I just want to say that um, and anyone who's interested could also talk to any one of our students. Um, that's something that often makes a difference, to hear from someone how they have managed to make it work. And just, you know, if someone has a passion to do something, don't let the logistics hold you back. I mean, I was in that boat of trying to think about how am I going to fund graduate school in the United States? Um, it's not, you know, unless you're independently wealthy, that's not something that people just decide to do one day. And, you know, talking to people who will support your passion, support your dream, is really important. So whoever it is that's helping you accomplish your life dream, accomplish your, your life goal, if it's you know, if it's something that you've heard me talking about and it's something that you think might be the place for you, then don't hesitate to call. It doesn't cost you anything to just have the conversation. Um, but you owe it to yourself to see, could I really do this or is this just a dream? Um, you'd be amazed to hear the stories of our students and, uh, you know, how they're accomplishing dreams that are so meaningful to them in their lives. So, you know, Give yourself a chance to accomplish that dream. Thank you. I agree. I am one of those students that thought I could never fund my education and could never go overseas. And I have been to Tavistock Clinic in Sigmund Freud University in Vienna, Austria. So, yes, I am one of those international students also. So I am doing the bridging work now also. And it's it's exciting. You can do it if you have the passion for it. You can find the funding. And I agree, Dr. McGrath, go for it. <laughs> you need, you That's owe it to yourself. You, you owe it to the world, right? Yes, exactly. It will be worth it. Yes. Thank you so much thank for you, being on Psych One on One, Dr. Brita McGrath. My pleasure, Julianne. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Take care. Have a great time in Baltimore and have a safe flight. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. And thank you so much for tuning into Psych One on One. If you would like to contact me, my office number is 562-234-4650. My email is jgoode8 at verizon.net. And my office is in Irvine, California. I would love to see you, talk to you, connect with me. Connect with me on, on Facebook at Psych One on One. Thank you so much. Cheyenne Hayes for doing a great job on the board today. Thanks to our executive producer, Jeremy Hansen, who is in San Francisco doing some biz. And thank you so much for listening in on Psych One on One. I am Julianne Good. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Bye now.